I'm Tanya. Welcome to the Edible Garden today. We're going to be doing this in the same format that we did last week because it worked pretty well, which is going to be, um, I'm going to introduce a video. I've made you two, um, two videos in the middle. You can, um, we can have a little bit of a chat. You can text your questions through or your comments. Just let me know how things are in your garden, what you're doing in your kitchen. It's kind of great to hear from you guys. So today we're going to be looking at composting three ways, three different ways that I compost. There's obviously various other ways also of getting rid of kitchen scraps and things like wormeries and so on. But if you've got any questions, I can try and answer those. And then uh, the second part is going to be me making some elderflower cordial because all the elder trees are currently all kind of popping out with their flowers. And uh, I know that a lot of people are wanting to make the cordial themselves this year. So um, listen in and uh, shall we roll with the first compost video? So today I'm going to talk about compost. Um, so this is one of the ubiquitous Dalek bins that we see all around London and around the country. They're very cheap to get new and you can get them second hand, you can get them free from free cycle um, and so on. So this one's about half full. Um, here we go. You can see there's a little bit of cardboard in there as well. And these tend to get quite dry sometimes, um, depending on what you put in them. I tend to just put in garden waste into that one and I found that it had a couple of slow worms in there earlier on so there must have been um, hibernating in there so I was quite excited about that. Uh, you get the compost when it's ready through from here. Uh, it can take easily a couple of, of years for that to happen um, and this I've placed in the sun um, yeah so sorry I'm gonna step back a little bit so yes so here we go so this one I've placed in the sun um, so that it rots down quicker. I'm going to show you another really easy way of composting as well, um, which is basically, I've, I had a little corner of the garden that wasn't really being used, it's out of sight, it's against the shed wall, so just piling stuff up there. Obviously no kitchen scraps, just stuff from the garden, it just gets piled up um, there. And then, uh, as an added bonus, uh, I can just use some of that stuff when I build my no-dig beds. It's just there, it's ready to go. It, another bonus, and the reason why I started this in the first place here, was I was getting uh, bindweed popping up uh, from the neighbor's plot, and it's popping up here. So I just, as I keep throwing more um, material onto it, it's popping up less and less, and it's pretty much... Uh, being contained now because it can't come up through there. Okay, um, I'm going to walk across to my third composting system. So this one is my hot bin. It's my uh, third composting system that I want to show you. It's covered in um, tape and in bits and pieces and that's to stop the cat digging its claws into it because it just found it absolutely irresistible and you can even see the claw marks there. Um, it's basically made of styrofoam. It's got a little uh, indicator of um, a well, thermostat and at the moment it, this says it's at about 40 degrees Celsius inside. I just looked and I think it's about 50. Um, and the way it works is, is this thing just comes off and then you can pull out the compost from the bottom. It takes about three months for the compost to be ready. Um, sometimes two months in the summer and a little bit longer in winter if it's a cold winter. And I'll just open this up just so you can see. This one gets quite wet. Um, so that's why I put in um, paper, um, anything that, you know, wrapping paper that doesn't have any ink on it. Um, brown paper bags, toilet rolls. I put all of that kind of stuff in here to soak up some of the moisture because this is where all the kitchen waste goes. Um, and let's see, yeah, it's at 55 degrees. 
at the moment. There's some banana peel and other very exciting yummy things. Um, and some worms so it looks like there's quite a little worm activity in there and I absolutely I've got to say I love this um, it's it's fairly big um, it's a fairly big bin but if you've got the space if you've got it somewhere near your kitchen door because that just makes it really easy to put stuff in um, it's uh, it, it's it's a very very good way of getting compost quickly and of course of getting rid of a lot of garden waste and kitchen waste as well but anyway so that's uh, composting three ways there we go i've opened the compost you can see that some really really nice fresh compost there complete with worms and it's all ready to go on the plants Hi, okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, initially, when I started my own compost bins and so on, I was quite confused because there's, you know, I went online and I was looking at, you know, how do you compost? And suddenly people are talking about percentages saying, you know, 60% brown matter and this much green matter, and, you know, and then looking at, you know, going really deep into the chemistry of it all. And, uh, and it was a little bit, it was a bit kind of difficult. I was thinking, well, you know, I don't have the time to like become this compost expert. So I literally just started throwing stuff in the bin and quite frankly, everything does rot down. You can optimize things, of course you can, but you know, it's time, isn't it? So anyway, so um, if you've got a bit of space, I would go for a compost bin. If you don't have that much space, but let's say you still have some outdoor space, you could try a wormery. Uh, you could try the Bokashi method, which I've never tried, uh, which is a kind of bacterial decomposition, um, as I understand it. Um, but the next, I think, you know, if you have any um, questions about compost, do type them up. Um, I'll see if there's anything else that I can dig up from my brains about it. Um, but if you don't for the moment, um, you can also save them to the end. And let's move on to making the elderflower cordial. Right now, the elderflowers are all out there in kind of, it's prime picking time. So you can make elderflower fritters, you can make elderflower champagne, you can make elderflower tea. The only thing is, you should remember that the little green parts of the elderflower kind of floret are mildly poisonous. I mean, they're not gonna kill you, but they will upset your stomach if you eat them. So the idea is to never actually eat them. You can soak them, you know, and so on, but just don't eat the green bits, okay? So um, yeah, uh, let's go to the video. Hi everyone, and welcome to my kitchen. Today, I'm going to make some elderflower cordial, a very simple recipe of um, elderflowers, sugar, citric acid. There's various other recipes online that you can try as well but this is one of the simple ways of making it. So I will also post some of the pictures of how I got to this stage. I went out with a friend, had a lovely time out in the park, picked some elderflowers, I put them into some boiled water for 24 hours and I've just pulled them all out just by hand out of uh, the water. So now I have covered it just to make sure no insects get in. That can go now. The smell is gorgeous. The smell, the scent is gorgeous and I haven't strained it. Some people strain it through a muslin but I there's lots of little flowers floating on the top there. But I quite like those and I put those in into the bottles as well just because they are pretty and they don't change the taste at all and it does give it a real kind of homemade feel. I've washed eight bottles um, of eight wine bottles, just normal wine bottles, and I've put them in the oven. I started off the oven at about 100 degrees and I've slowly moved it up to 150 or so. Again, there's lots of different suggestions on how long they need to be in there and so on. I've kept the bottles in there for about half an hour. This is to sterilize them, to make sure that you don't get some kind of mold or things that you don't want 
once you've gone through all of the trouble of actually making some of this. So they're in there sterilizing. I have also taken the lids off them and put them in a pan. Can you see? There we go. And poured some boiling water over those. Again, those are just in there sterilizing. And all I'm going to do is put the sugar in the pan, the citric acid in the pan, put it all on the heat and mix it all in together. I don't bring it to a boil as such, but I heat up the liquid properly. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so I've put three kilograms of sugar in here. There's four and a half liters of water. I've tried to reduce the sugar more than that, but the sugar is basically in there so that the cordial keeps is not so much for the taste, because I would actually like to have it a little bit less sweet than that, but I tested it with two, with two and a half kilograms, and those batches actually went off. This way, with the three kilograms per 4.5 liters of water, it actually keeps, I mean, I've kept a bottle for a couple of years because I forgot it was there, otherwise they get drunk way, way earlier. So. I'm just going to stir that in and you've got to keep stirring at this point to make sure that the sugar doesn't catch. Maybe have it on fairly low, on a low heat because yeah, you, do, you don't want burnt sugar at the bottom of the pan. So you just keep mixing that. You can use any kind of sugar. I used one part demerara sugar or well, golden granulated sugar to two parts white, mainly because that's what I happen to have, but also I've tried demerara sugar before, which is lovely, but it really leaves a taste and it's sometimes hard to discern the older flowers if your sugar taste is really strong. So although I tend to use a lot of um, unrefined or less refined sugar, in baking and things like that, here the white sugar is actually quite good because it lets the elderflower flavour come through. So, also at the moment we're still in lockdown and everybody seems to be baking like crazy, so it took me a couple of trips and a couple of shops to get all this sugar in. So. Going to keep stirring. It doesn't really matter when you put the sugar, when you put the um, citric acid in. I kept this out just to kind of show you. That's the citric acid. I have already weighed it. That's 50 grams, which is um, exactly the right amount for this amount of uh, cordial. So I'm just going to pop that straight in there and keep stirring. That's pretty much dissolved, but I'm going to keep giving it a stir every so often. In the meanwhile, I'll take out my bottles from the oven. They've now been in there um, about half an hour. I've lowered the temperature a little bit as well. What you don't want is to change the temperature on the bottles too quickly, you know, so going from really cold to really hot to then pouring really hot liquid into them. So I actually like to sterilize them as I am cooking this rather than before because that means that the bottles are still hot as the hot liquid is going into them and then you're minimizing the chance of them breaking or cracking with the change in temperature. Ooh. Wow, that was hot. That came straight through the glove. Of course, you've got to be prepared. Make sure that 
You either drink lots of wine before the elderflower season starts or make sure that a friend drinks lots of wine for you and keeps the bottles. I actually don't bother taking the labels off, but you can soak them a little bit and uh, they'll, they tend to come off relatively easily. Um, they will also often come off in the oven. Okay, this is starting to make some bubbling noises, so just giving it another stir. You can feel it just sticking a little bit around the edge. So, giving it a proper scrub around there. In fact, I'm going to lower the heat a little bit as well. There we go. Yeah, the sugar likes to stick to the bottom of the pan. Turn the heat up a little bit. I do want this to be thoroughly hot through with all of the sugar dissolved really well. Usually takes about 10 or 15 minutes to get it to that point. You'll know when it's ready, it starts, it doesn't really bubble, but just around the edges it starts getting a little bit frothy and you start getting this very thin white froth on the top. Almost there. I am going to dry out the corks. So that is almost there now. You'll need something like this to help you pour. Ideally it would be metal, not plastic, but this is a pretty sturdy plastic, it's not going to melt. Usually I don't wash the flowers before putting them in the water, but I do give them a little shake just to make sure that if there's any insects and so on they get dislodged. Another good trick is to leave them, I pick them and put them in a canvas bag so they can breathe and then I put that canvas bag outside, just give it, it kind of open it up, roll it out and just give it a couple of hours because if it does have any insects in they tend to just get out and fly out, um, you know, any little bugs and stuff. So by the time I then bring them to the sink, give them a shake, there's usually very little um, in the way of bugs there. Okay, this is done. That's hot. It's all been dissolved through. And this is very hot. Right. It's good to keep something like this to hand so you can handle the bottles which are still hot and this. And then we just fill. I fill the bottles not, I don't fill them completely full, partly because I want to be able to see what's happening inside the bottle, just in case the odd batch or whatever does go off or get any mould, which thankfully hasn't happened in a long while. Um, some people fill them right, right up, I guess to make sure that there's no air in there, but because they're there's always a bit of air in there and this seems to work for me. This is kind of what I do. I put the cork on now, but once it cools, I do tighten the cork a little bit as well. I'm just going to bring this closer to the camera. So you can see, I kind of fill it to about there. You might be able to see there's a few little flowers floating around on the top and this one's ready and can be put aside. I've got to say, one of the nicest things about making this is just the beautiful scent. I'm just standing here in elderflower scent. It's quite heady and it's, it's wonderful and um, for hours afterwards the whole house smells of elderflowers, so I do love that. Also, oops, let's get the next bottle. 
while you're picking it's quite interesting because different trees have different smells some trees have very very fragrant flowers and other trees not so much uh, must depend on where they grow their conditions and so on so have a sniff before you pick and choose good trees okay bottle number two them cool. As I say, I tighten up the corks a little bit and they're ready to go. I just store them in a cupboard, use them as I need them. Once they're open, I do store them in the fridge. I'm, um, I've had a couple go off that I didn't do that with, so I do uh, pop them in the fridge once they're open. Um, another one of my favourite things about this is it really feels like it marks the start of summer and just going out into a park to forage for these scented flowers with a friend, we have a chat, we catch up, um, it's so stress reducing, it's fantastic. Sometimes it feels like the cordial is really secondary to the actual picking of the flowers and to going out there and being, you know, with a friend. And it's kind of, it's twice as nice because you've made it yourself. It's twice as nice because you remember where you went this year to pick them, who you were with, the kind of stuff that you were chatting about and so on. You can't get that by buying the cordial in the shop. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, there's various recipes uh, online that you can try. Some of them, instead of using um, the citric acid, use lemons, you need to grate them, you need to squeeze them and all the rest of it. Um, if anybody wants to do a comparison of recipes and you know, send me what you think, that would be amazing. Um, this is just quite a quick and easy recipe and it tastes beautiful. So I haven't done a lot of um, you know, different experimentation with that. Um, the recipe for this, uh, including, you know, how much of everything goes in is on the Edible Garden Facebook page. I'll post a link to that, um, you know, when, when we wrap up. Um, and there's so many different use, uses for this. You know, obviously you can just drink it as a cordial, um, but I also put it into possibly something like a Cava cocktail, a Prosecco cocktail. Um, you know, obviously just into sparkling water. Uh, sometimes you can make a gin and tonic with a little splash of it. Um, so that's, you know, just the sky's the limit with drinks. I also use it instead of honey or instead of sugar in some recipes because it gives you a little bit of a floral scent to that as well. Um, and uh, you could, uh, something I haven't tried yet, but I'm definitely going to is to make, um, make a jelly with them. And then, you know, you, you can then layer that jelly. There's a question um, from Caro, which is Caro, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name, sorry. Um, any idea where they might be locally? So there's a lot of places <clears throat> locally. Um, I recently went to the Norwood Country Park uh, where there's uh, quite a lot of the trees. They, they tend to get two flushes of flower. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of people picking but there's plenty left. Um, there's also some in Crystal Palace Park. Um, this is something somebody's told me. I haven't been picking there. And you know what? They are in, in little bits of green. You'll see them. They're really distinctive. I've got one in my neighbor's back garden. Another neighbor's got one kind of in their hedge. Um, as long as you're not picking them really close to a road, and I mean like two or three meters, uh, you know, you need to social distance yourself from a road. And, and then you can pretty much pick them um, from anywhere. So just keep an eye out. But there's definitely some in, um, in the Norwood Country Park and in Crystal Palace Park locally. Um, so yes, uh, where else? Oh yes, I was giving you some ideas on how to use it. Another thing is if you're making a cake and you need to moisten uh, the sponge, again, you can um, moisten it with this instead of um, a juice. And a couple of weeks ago, I made a Cavallo Nero dish where I said you can use honey, but I always use this elderflower cordial. So if you have a look back, it was the very first episode of these that I did, um, and you'll find the recipe there. Um, 
Any other questions? I'm just having a look. Um, oh, great. Um, so yeah, as you're walking the dogs, for example, you can keep an eye out um, and take a little canvas bag or something, take a little tote bag and pick them. Um, don't, uh, the other thing is don't pick them really, really low down because dogs and foxes may kind of spray those areas. So, you know, from about waist height up, I would say, uh, to pick them. There is one other um, similar kind of bush that's got these white flowers, but you'll always be able to recognize an elderflower by its smell. Another thing that I did mention in that video is the trees do smell different. Some of them are more fragrant than others, so, so find a good tree. And when you are foraging, don't pick like all the flowers off the tree. Try and pick maybe, you know, a maximum of five to 10 off of each tree. Because also, you know, obviously the, the, the tree needs to be putting these out. You need to leave some for other people. And um, later on in the year, I'm also gonna be posting my recipe for elderberry cordial. And obviously you need to let some of those flowers go to berries so that you can then pick the berries. Um, so yes, I mean, it's, it's well worth making, making some of this cordial. As I say, I mean, I really enjoy the process of the making it, of the picking of the flowers, of the, the, the smells. Um, and it makes you, somehow makes me feel kind of quite grounded. It makes me feel like summer has finally begun um, and so on. So, so yes, uh, next week, um, I'm gonna do a similar thing again. I'm going to prepare a video for you in the kitchen. And I'm also gonna prepare something from the garden. So um, hopefully, again, something that uh, is really useful to you. If you want to drop me a line, again, you can reach me through the Edible Garden page. If you suddenly have some burning questions, drop me a line, and then that might either inspire me to do a video on it, or just, you know, talk live about those issues. So that's pretty much it for today. My strawberries have started coming through in the garden. I don't know if anybody else has strawberries. Um, so my next task, my next pleasant task is to go out there into the sunshine, pick a few of them, and I'm going to try my hand for the first time in my life um, at making white chocolate strawberry truffles. So I'm not gonna video that because I suspect it might be a little bit messy the first time I ever do it. But if the recipe works well, I'll post that as well. So let me just check if there's any other questions. Um, brilliant. And as I say, if you think of anything else, just post it on this, um, on this feed and I'll check it You know, over the next few hours. I'll check it this evening and I'll answer any last minute questions and things like that on there. So thank you very much for tuning in, for listening, um, you know, for talking with me, because it's great to know that, that you guys are out there, you know, for real, I'm not just talking to some camera. So um, I really enjoy that. So thank you very much. And I will see you next week.